Thank you very much, Owen, uh, for that introduction. Uh, it reminded me of some of the things that uh, I might have forgotten about. Uh, and um, welcome, welcome you all to this conference. Um, uh, I must pay tribute to Owen, who has done the, the lines. I'm sure Nigel would agree that Owen has done the lion's share of the work in organising this conference. And I feel that I've done uh, very little uh, in comparison. Uh, so I'm very grateful Sorry. for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I might say something else uh, tomorrow, yes. <laughs> um, now, I'm going to offer some reflections on, on homelessness, uh, basically off of my kind of career and, and life relating to homelessness. Uh, and my first, my first reflection is that the visibility of homelessness has increased uh, nationally and globally. I started working in housing in 1975 for a local authority in Sussex, and that was the first time in my life that I came across homelessness. Uh, but in some ways, when I compare those days with now, in, so, in some ways, things were much better in 1975. Nobody was, was sleeping rough. Uh, when people became homeless, and particularly families, they were put in temporary accommodation. Uh, the temporary accommodation was uh, generally very unsatisfactory. Uh, certainly the, the accommodation that, uh, I, that I had to deal with was... Uh, you know, it's kind of ashamed actually putting people in this kind of accommodation. So I'm not saying it was good in those days, um, but of course uh, we were still putting uh, families in bed and breakfast. And uh, I've seen bed and breakfast accommodation more recently, and it's not a lot better than it was in 1975, to be honest. So if I could make a direct comparison over those 40, 45 years, what I've forgotten the uh, my arithmetic's failed me now, but <laughs> 45 years. Uh, actually things have got worse. So we've got more people sleeping rough. We didn't have that before. So I thought that was my first reflection, this great visibility of homeless. And that also operates on a global level. Globally, uh, numbers of homeless have increased uh, to quite considerably and the, uh, the poor relief uh, is not available in a lot of countries that we have traditionally had in this country. So my first my second, so that's my first reflection, increased visibility of homelessness. Now my second kind of reflection is the, uh, how things have turned out globally. Uh, homelessness, I think as uh, Owen suggested, is, uh, is now a huge and growing global issue. This quote from New International, nearly a quarter of the world's population lives in informal settlements or slums, etc. Uh, and now those are interesting kind of criteria relating to homelessness because uh, in the UK, because of our particular homeless legislation, at least some of that would count as being homeless because these were not conditions that uh, in this country we regarded as reasonably available to, to have, to occupy. And uh, as, you, as a lot of you know, the definition of homelessness in the UK is that if accommodation is not available for your reasonable occupation, then you could be classified as homeless. It doesn't necessarily follow, actually, but it, that can be the case. Whereas in m most of the world, that's not the case. Uh, these people would not be regarded as homeless. They'd be living in, in slums uh, without any sanitation or water, but they would not be regarded as homeless. So I think that's, uh, that's quite important to note, because if you look at the statistics for, for global homelessness, they do obviously run into millions, tens of millions, um, but if they're using the UK law definition of homelessness, there'll be far, far greater numbers. Anything, anything up to this is entirely fanciful, this over 90% figure, I've just made it up. But it's going to be a considerably larger uh, than the official figures. Uh, and I think that's uh, it's important to note the differences between the UK and a lot of the rest of the world. I say that, to be fair, that's not just UK standards in finding homelessness in other European countries are fairly similar. Uh, to those in the UK, but not uh, in other parts of the world. Now, on top of all that, quite separately, we've got tens of millions of so-called forcibly displaced persons, and that, that means people who've been displaced across national borders, officially, according to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, 68.5 million of those in the last year, and that's an all-time record high. Uh, and to those, we could add all those internally displaced persons, these are persons actually are made homeless within the countries for which no official figures exist globally. Uh, so this is a purely an estimate from the uh, United Nations High Commission of Refugees, 4.1.3 million. But the actual figure, 
uh, particularly if it's due to, uh, to armed conflict and civil wars are going on, is not known. So the, figure, the true figure is going to be significantly higher than that 41, 41 million, but that's their, their kind of best estimate. So these, these are numbers which are far, far greater than have ever been recorded in human history. Uh, so I think that's the, that's, the, that's the reflection I had on that. And yeah, final point on that, that some national governments, and I, I name India in particular here, are actively increasing the numbers of homelessness in, in their countries um, under the, uh, the Modi regime, but this has been going on um, for, for many decades now. But this has been increasing. Uh, the estimates now is that uh, the plans that Indian government have now uh, for um, and new highways, airports and so on, will displace more than 11 million of their citizens, for which they are not actually providing any support. So I think that's, it's also important to note the, um, the activities of government, not, not so much in reducing homelessness, but actually increasing it. Now, um, my remaining reflections will relate to, to the UK, um, as I thought, the UK is what um, probably what most of you are, are interested in, focused on. Um, and the first of these reflections is that you notes know, the persistence of poor law attitudes uh, in the UK. Um, there's a lot, lot more that can be said about this than what I'm, I'm saying here, but it's basically the, the legislation continues to reflect in rather subtle forms the old dis poor law distinction between the deserving and undeserving homeless. Uh, and you can see that distinction between priority need and non-priority need, between intentional and unintentional homelessness, as to whether they're blameless or not, uh, and the local connection, because their poor law was based on uh, association with particular parish, as a lot of you will know. Um, so the key question I obviously want to raise there in reflecting is who is seen as deserving and undeserving, uh, and um, this is the sort of picture that you get, and a lot of you will be familiar with it, this kind of distinction. It's very well used among the sort of public generally. Uh, some people say yes, if they've got young children, health problems, domestic violence, uh, accidental things, acts of God, all that. People are generally uh, that those are deserving of help and assistance, provision of accommodation. So that's priority need. And those undeserving are people who are basically able to solve, seen as being able to solve their own housing problem, and that will apply to all kind of able-bodied single people and couples and not responsible for children. Uh, and um, they're kind of a grey area in relation to vulnerability, as a lot of you know, I right? you know, because some of those um, single people and couples, they will have all kinds of um, problems and not perhaps fully realised and vulnerable in some ways. So the, over the years, uh, things have been added to, particularly the Homelessness Act 2002, added a number of categories to the list of, of vulnerable people. Uh, but this kind of uh, question of vulnerability is, is very problematic. And, and uh, I'd want to say that, that um, uh, we're all vulnerable. We're all vulnerable um, as human beings. Uh, homeless, I always say to students, anybody could be, end up homeless and depends on circumstances. But it appears just that some are more vulnerable than others. Mm. And, uh, my next comment on um, the poor law in relation to non-priority, non-priority homeless. So this is the kind of technical term, as a lot of you will know, in relation to, to people who are, are not for whom the local authority does not have um, a duty to provide secure, secure accommodation for them. Um, and this is a basic continuation of the old idea, poor law idea of, of paupers and vagrants, um, but now rebranded as rough sleepers. Uh, so the attitude is the same, to, uh, but the, the terminology has changed. Uh, and as uh, Owen points out, the Vacancy Act still applies, so rough sleeping could be regarded as a, as a criminal offence. Uh, it's not usually enforced, uh, fortunately, but, <laughs> excuse me, uh, but that is um, a, legal, a legal reality. Uh, now, um, interestingly though, um, other policies have developed, 
since 1990, particularly to, to help rough sleepers. Uh, so this started with John Major, the Rough Sleepers Initiative came in 1990 and it was uh, actually highlighted, he, well he said it himself that uh, he regarded these, these are the people you step over when you come out of the opera, was it, I can't remember now whether it was going into the opera or coming out, uh, but it doesn't really matter, uh, that's the, that was his perception and uh, so the, the basic motivation for the new policy was to get these people off the streets basically so that, so that we wouldn't be able to see them. To be out of sight, out of mind. And, and that, what, that was a deliberate policy. It was to, you wanted them out of public tension so it wouldn't be uh, raised as a complaint to government. Uh, so that's how the um, policy started. And the, the, the policy was basically about uh, reducing the numbers of people visibly sleeping rough. Uh, and as I say, it started the Rough Sleepers Initiative. And what we have now, so many years later, last year, 2018, so it's 18. Oh, <laughs> my arithmetic's going to pop today. That's 28 years after the original Rough Sleepers Initiative, we now have the Rough Sleeping Initiative. Yeah, uh, and so these are, this, is, this is the way things have gone. Basically, actually, no progress whatsoever in terms of uh, policy thinking. Um, and I say that's just tacking the symptoms, not the causes of homelessness. So... Um, pardon? Yeah, I'll keep going for a few minutes. Yeah. I'll skip over the, the, the targets. I had a sort of um, bee in my bonnet about targets, but basically you're saying uh, this system of targeting doesn't attack the root causes of homelessness, just sets a target. This isn't just on homelessness policy, it's a whole range of policies where targets are set and then others, the government expects others to come up with ways to reach those targets and uh, therefore the funding that's provided to reach the targets never quite matches what's needed to, to reach them and uh, they persist with the target. It's quite surprising the coalition government actually uh, continued to go along with the, the new Labour target for ending rough sleeping by 2012 but then 2012 came and uh, suddenly uh, there was no more talk about the uh, ending homeless rough sleeping in 2012 uh, and it's only uh, last year that we got the new rough sleeping strategy with a new target of 2027. I was going to say something about, uh, oh, I'll leave that for now, but the, the no second night out is the, the only kind of really successful government policy uh, uh, on rough sleeping because it significantly reduced the, the numbers sleeping rough. But of course that, um, that only operated in parts of England. Uh, there are whole main areas of England where it did not apply and the government funding ceased 2015. So it's been left up to local authorities to continue that policy. In. There will be some comment on that, I think, in, over the conference. Yeah. Causes, all on causes of homelessness, all I want to say is a reflection that um, this kind of thinking that, that this is the cause of homelessness, the ending of a short, short hold tendency, what I say, of course, that is the leading immediate trigger for homelessness. So it's, that's, that's, when somebody becomes homeless, that's what they'll be most likely cite in the official documents that their assured short hold, hold tenancy ended. So that's, it's true, that is the most common immediate cause, but because that doesn't tell you about the underlying causes. Not the, and uh, that could be dealt with by a change in the law, of course. We could go back to the Pre-Housing Act 1998, uh, when they did have protection from eviction, uh, so that was stopped by the 1988 Act, and that would automatically deal with that particular trigger. Uh, so it would reduce the amount of back cost the government's not to. And the government is considering doing that, so that's, that's good to hear. Homeless, uh, so won't go through this in detail, but this is, some, many of you will be familiar with this kind of a distinction. Is, uh, homelessness as a symptom of deeper problems. Owen just mentioned that actually sometimes homelessness is a solution to a problem. Uh, so that immediately sh shows that uh, there's something deeper going on here. Uh, and it is this combination of the personal problems and the system problems. So this is extremely complex. And the relationship between the different kinds of problems is still not really very, very well understood. Uh, and so this, of course, is the sort of thing that we, we like to do research on here, to actually to understand these, these relationships. And I, it's probably fair to say that uh, understanding has improved you know, to, to a small extent over the years. But I, I think actually we've got a long way to go uh, before we understand these things really well 
uh, and then have policies we can be confident that these will deal with, deal with them. No, I haven't got time to do this. This is, this is a very depressing uh, story, so um, uh, perhaps I'll skip. How am I out of time? Running out of time. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave over the Michael Gething story. But basically, this was a, a, a story, just a case study to show how, uh, partic in a particular area of England, uh, the system fails completely. You know, there's somebody who died totally unnecessarily. Um, so it's a very depressing story, so, but, uh, but I can, I'm kind of happy to elaborate, elaborate on it. And I didn't want, it's also because I risk, you risk singling out a particular local authority there. And uh, I should say, uh, South Ham's uh, I've named it now, but it's not the only authority in England by any means uh, that fails the homeless in this, in this way. Now this is my kind of deeper reflections on uh, how the system has changed and uh, because of course I'm, I'm going on saying actually uh, there are these uh, deeper causes of homelessness um, but we're not addressing them uh, and of course when you try to address them then you go much belong, much, much wider uh, than housing, the housing system. The housing market obviously is a very key part of this so I've italicised in particular, particular things but um, uh, it's, um, it goes beyond a whole system of law, property ownership, uh, wealth and so on. Um, I will just uh, make one point here because I'm running out of time. Um, but as house, house prices go up, uh, so the organisation like the Daily Mail you know, think that's great for house prices to go up. All, any rise in house prices is harmful to homelessness. Is it there? It's not an immediate connection, but any, what, what you're gaining in your ownership of property, the value of property, somebody else is losing. It's, it's not created out of nothing. Uh, so if, you're a house, if you own a house and the price of the house has gone up tenfold, uh, that is tenfold worse for somebody else. Basically, it is, it is a zero-sum game. There isn't this idea of the whole thing whole thing gets better. That's, that's the main point we want to get over, but how can you actually persuade people to, uh, to take on these things? Yep, and um, this is my last slide. This is my last slide. Let me have you. But I, uh, I have, it's the last slide, it's the most important slide, because I know a lot of you work in for homeless services, and so I do want to say, yeah, that most homeless services are doing a really good job. <laughs> and it's not just a sticking plaster, you know, they are actually find real, help, real help for people. And it's also essential, essential to have these kind of services. And I even can identify sort of the key functions of those services. You know, so outreach, outreach now recognised as a key function, but wasn't, wasn't always uh, the case. And the key worker working closely with the individual homeless people, you know, really important. And then as we found in research, very important behind the sort of key worker and the, uh, the individual homeless organisation, this kind of community practice involving the local authority, the kind of range of homelessness organisations operating in the area. So we've, we found this in Stoke and Trent on our research, and we, we feel, yeah, and the same thing of finding Greater Munch and in other, in other areas. But again, important to point out that not all areas have this kind of supportive community practice. Uh, and terror accommodation, obviously, Right, I don't need to comment on those. But um, so, final thing I say, uh, uh, but a couple of bits of good news. Um, Andy Burnham giving 15% of his salary to the Greater Manchester Home Homelessness Fund. You know, so that's an example for others to follow. Uh, nobody's followed it yet, uh, but um, uh, you know, for, it wouldn't take too many people to follow Andy Burnham's example and to to actually solve the uh, homeless problem in this country. So that's really something to. Uh, something to take home with you. Uh, and um, Milton Keynes, I've just said, because it, I keep coming back to this point that some councils are actively increasing the numbers of homes in the areas, particularly in London, in some of the London boroughs. So it's very important to note that. They don't, they don't really care about homelessness, these, these authorities. And Milton Keynes was a, a classic example of one of these, um, but it's now abandoned that, that plan, I'm very pleased to say. So thank you. Thank you very much.